of the largest city in the entire uh, state. Um, and so we obviously, even though we're in Kansas, we find ourselves with a large homeless population uh, just due to that, that, that circumstance. Um, we're a team of four officers. Uh, we work all the 911 calls throughout the city that are homeless related, and whether it's you know a trespassing or even welfare call, calls or uh, camping you know illegally. Um, but our focus is not on trying to cite homeless people or to get them in jail. It's actually the exact opposite. We look to divert charges away from the court system and get them into services. Uh, what we've learned, uh, there was a study done by University of North Carolina, Charlotte, that showed if you can get a homeless person off the streets and into permanent housing, it actually reduces those vagrancy arrests by 84%. So from a law enforcement perspective, um, if that's our goal, then the, the answer is not through minor arrests and tickets. It's actually getting them stabilized and getting into housing, getting them the case management they need for the reasons why they were homeless. So you're not seeing the same homeless people over and over again. Uh, I spent my entire 22 years uh, working in the downtown area with our homeless population. You know, prior to even having a police homeless outreach team, I saw a revolving door of homeless going into the jail, coming back out the next day, and then we start the process all over again. And so I really wanted to look at how do we break that cycle? And that's when I got trained uh, in 2011, a new concept at that time was police homeless outreach teams. Uh, brought that back to our city, uh, wrote a policy and procedure, um, an SOP, and uh, an ordinance. And then when we went live in 2013, and so we've been operating uh, every year for about 10 years. Um, uh, our current stats, we've assisted one over 1,400 homeless off the streets in permanent housing, and we've reduced our chronic homeless population by uh, 68% um, by working in partnership with uh, a lot of the providers that are out there uh, with, a, with a focus on housing and getting them stabilized. Um, and we also do uh, a lot of different things, uh, helping them get into inpatient treatment for substance abuse. So I will, like I said, we'll divert charges. So if we see someone in a park and they're drinking in public, we might say, hey, instead of going to jail, let's get you into inpatient treatment. Um, now we're working on the real reasons why they're homeless, right? And then uh, maybe they can get clean and sober and they can uh, get a job and then we can get them into housing. And now they're not going to that park drinking anymore. Now they're housed and now they're paying taxes. And it's a win-win for everybody, win for uh, the homeless person, the citizens in the area, and also the police department, you know? So um, that's really our focus um, is really non-traditional type policing. Uh, we also started a drop program with our court system where if a you know, homeless person does get a ticket for jaywalking or something like that. If they work with us, we'll formulate a plan on their homeless situation. Maybe it's just getting a job or signing up for a housing voucher that they weren't doing before. Then we can, if they accomplish the goals that we set, that, set them out to do, then they can, uh, we'll send in a form to our prosecutor's office and get some of those minor charges uh, dropped. Nothing major, no felonies and non-victim non -victim type minor crimes. So. Um, that's kind of a, a quick overview of uh, how we operate and, and uh, what we do. Um, I don't think I missed anything, uh, but I'll kind of turn it over to Regina if she has anything to say. No, I can just give an overview of our community's mental health and how we interact with the homeless outreach team. Um, our community crisis center has um, both the mobile crisis unit, uh, co-responder unit, and then a collaborative approach both are gonna, inter all, all three are gonna interact with the homeless outreach team. And then our outpatient services have that path, um, which coordinates care and connects individuals to ongoing mental health services as well. So oftentimes our two teams often work together. Thank you both. So I'm going to let everyone know that they can post questions in the chat, but you can also feel free to come off mute and ask your questions directly, but I'll um, kick us off. Uh, so Officer Nate, we talked about how this is an issue in a lot of areas, and you mentioned that your model is really scalable to different types of jurisdictions with different sizes, different communities. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Right. I do. Uh, I've done a lot of work for um, different federal agencies as far as training other departments. And, and one thing I will say is that this is very scalable. I've, I've worked for large agent agencies. Uh, I helped implement um, a homeless outreach team in Salt Lake City and, and other large ones. Um, I've gotten 
I've helped out agencies that were so small. I think they only had like maybe their population. Uh, it was like 30,000 people or something, you know, and then even in those jurisdictions, it might be not four officers. You might just have one officer who's more like a liaison or like a CIT call out. Like you still work in patrol. You're not as your patrol officer, but in a situation where you're, it's a homeless related call, maybe he gets that call and he's diverted because he's going to be an expert in the resources. And that's really what our specialty team is, is we're an expert in all the resources that are out there to help the homeless person where the average officer um, isn't. So this is definitely scalable uh, to from large departments to smaller ones. I have an algorithm where I, I analyze your homeless point in time count and how many homeless you have. And that kind of gives me a good idea on, on what your homeless outreach team would look like for your city based on your homeless population numbers. Thank you. So the first question in the chat um, it says, Regina, can you speak to what agreements or consents you utilize to share information with law enforcement? Yeah, we kind of operate under two umbrellas. So on the outpatient side, when law enforcement, specifically that hot team works with outpatient services um, path, we have releases of information. So the patient will have to sign that release of information to coordinate care and continue to provide information like disability status that is needed for housing vouchers, that kind of stuff. Our mobile crisis unit, um, they operate under crisis services. So they are called out when there is a crisis, a mental health crisis, behavioral health crisis, substance use crisis. So on scene, coordination of care is provided through um, crisis. Um, and then the co-responder teams, we do have MOUs with City of Wichita for our co-responder teams and in our collaborative approach. But then again, they would also operate sharing information under crisis emergency services where HIPAA can be laxed in that way. I think I'd like to comment on as our, our homeless outreach team is also part of a system called HMIS, which is a computer database with our homeless population. It's all the providers working together, coordinating efforts. Um, there are releases for that for, for someone to be in there. And so we're a part of that system. Therefore, we're able to communicate uh, through that, that database and that system as well. Um, and, and so that's one way that uh, we're able to have communication you know, in regards to the, the people that we're serving. And I would clarify that our community mental health people do not have access to HMIS. That is specifically our PATH outreach workers. Alicia, since that question, you had questions around HMIS, did you want to come off mute? Do you have any other questions about that? Um, I work with um, the Kansas Balance of State Continuum of Care. And um, so we are actually kind of looking into what this would look like for us for for the balance of state um, of Kansas. And so I was just curious if one of the one of the concerns that has come up is um, is um, law enforcement having access to HMIS and whether that would be um, encroaching on clients' privacy. Um, we know as providers that the, the police department is there obviously to help the situation and not just to arrest people, but um, clients often have that concern um, themselves. So I was just curious if the Wichita Police Department does have, like, are you able to just log into HMIS and see anybody's stuff or are there different kinds of forms you have to sign or how does that work for you guys? Well, we're the, the same as all providers. I mean, even someone you could sit in front of me could go and illegally share information. So we work on the same guidelines that you do. So there's no difference. And um, I've already had conversations with the United States or state council and also the department of justice and they and HUD, HUD actually uh, their attorneys, they, they encourage agencies to get law enforcement involved because they've kind of been separate. And this is a way to get us, sharing information and working together. So they actually encourage this. And, and by not doing it, you're actually going against the, the best practices that the federal government had wants you to do. Um, okay. So we, we operate no different. The only people have access to, as far as law enforcement, is our homeless outreach team. There's really no reason for the average officer to have access to that. 
Um, but we follow the same uh, HIPAA laws and guidelines that you do. We're no different and we're, okay. we're not nothing special. So, you know, if we gave away information, that would be a violation. Just like if you gave away information, that would be a violation. So we have to mm -hmm. abide by the same rules that you do. Yeah, I think that people are just more concerned with giving information and that resulting in arrests rather than just giving away any information. That's not really co the concern, I don't think. But um, giving out or being having access to information for arrest purposes. and I think there probably was people, uh, there were some providers that had that concern. But since we've been on, we've been on HMS for well, years ago, we were on it, and then we were off for a little bit, and now we're back on. And uh, as far as I know, and Regina, you can correct me, we've never ran into a single homeless person that had that concern. Uh, okay. We've also built up a lot of clout with our homeless outreach team. Uh, okay. All the homeless know who we are. They know my name. I go by Officer Nate because my last name is too long to pronounce. So that's mm -hmm. why I'm known as the street. And, you know, people come up, and they know we're here to help. And so they, as long as you build that trust and that rapport, um, I don't. it's never been an issue for us at all. And how would you suggest um, other law enforcement agencies, um, like in the Balance of State area, um, do that, like build up trust? Well, I think they have to prove themselves a little bit. I mean, we had to do that. Do you start uh, just a homeless outreach team? Do you start uh, just a liaison? They have mm -hmm. to be attending the COC meetings and, mm -hmm. and have an investment and, and a reason why they're there and, and that they want to help. And that's how you're going to build up your cloud. And if you look at the guidelines for HMS by HUD, um, the, the COC actually votes who can have access to HMIS. So mm -hmm. if you built up that rapport with your COC as a police department, um, then your COC is the one that actually votes to who, who can have access to the HMIS. So we should start with first involving um, law enforcement in the COC meetings and then graduate from there into having HMIS access. Yeah, and like, you know, how are they going to be involved in, in a homeless intervention process? They don't have a homeless outreach team, and they don't have a, or a homeless liaison, and they're not attending meetings. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, how would, why would they even need to do be in there, you know? And I'm saying yeah. as a police officer, because it shouldn't be used for doing um, warrant sweeps or anything like mm -hmm. looking up for people who are wanted. That's not the purpose of the system. Mm -hmm. um, so it would just have to be at the COC, and, and you know, do they have... A, a homeless related program within the police department that we can trust. And that's going to be who can have access to the HMI system. Another good workaround, which we did for a while where, where there was a few years where we didn't have access to it. But what we did is we, our police department had housing in housing uh, members that work with our hot team that they're for housing purposes and they had access to it. So if we, mm -hmm. I, you know, Johnny's uh, home housing first voucher is ready. I call up my housing and she accesses it and tells me, oh yeah, he's staying at the mission. Great. I'll go talk with him and let's, let's start apartment hunting, hunting. So that's another workaround where you're not giving it to the law enforcement, but you have someone that within the city that does. Um, that How's might be, yeah. And so that's kind of how we started to build that trust. And then now we have, have access to it completely now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we also got, do you, uh, do you and the response, I think Amers is missing, um, do you think the response team is successful in identifying and addressing all the populations of homelessness? It seems that the model may be very successful at addressing the chronic adult population and those who are visibly homeless, um, but what about families, children, and youth who aren't commonly on the streets? Is that for Regina, I'm assuming? That one is addressed to both of you. Okay. See, I can try and start, and I'm going to piggy off what Nate has already said about our community and our relationships. Um, yes, I do think that we have a population that couch surf, that are often not accessing shelters, not utilizing our homeless, already established homeless resources. But I think that. The homeless outreach team within city of Wichita Police Department has names and relationships. So does our co-responder team. And I do think that within our community, the relationships that are we built does allow us to expand our resources and supports to some of those tough to serve populations. I don't know, Nate, you can 
Yeah, I mean, our, uh, you know, our, our homeless outreach team, we're not specific towards any population. You know, I know there's the VA has veteran outreach workers, but they only work with veterans, you know, or your mental health, they only work with someone who has mental health issues or, mm -hmm. or vice versa. Um, we, we work with everybody uh, regardless. Um, we, all, we have a, a phone system where we use a, a company. There's different brands that are out there. Uh, but it, basically, a person can call one number, and it's our homeless outreach team, and all of our cell phones ring off this one number. And whoever answers it, we assist that person. Uh, even if they're housed, but they're going to be getting evicted, we connect them with the eviction resolution program through the county. Um, so we're working with all those populations, not necessarily those that are homeless, but are um, on the brink of becoming homeless. Because if we don't do something to assist them, then they are going to become homeless, and we're going to have to start working with them and helping them. We don't want to do that. So um, we try to make sure that we're trying to resource for all the different types of population. Um, and, uh, you know, we, our numbers, uh, listed in the 211, which is through United Way. I think maybe it's called different things in other states. Um, and it's basically a, a number like 911. It's called 211. You call them, they get resources and they'll give out our number a lot to help start connecting people with, uh, resources in the community. Thank you. Um, the most the most common question, how is the program funded and is there a broad community and political support for it? As far as our homeless outreach team, uh, originally I wanted to write grants to get us started, but the, the chief at the time, he said no. And I was like, well, why not? And he said, well, a lot of times grants, they're good for like three years. And when the grant ends, the program goes away. And he's like, this is a great program. I want the last. So how do we fund it within, within the department? And I think... Uh, I actually have a slide on a PowerPoint that I give that we've actually, if you take a homeless person, they typically, there are different um, studies out there, but one study I found that the average homeless person in a year can rack up as much as $54,000 in resources, but if you give them housed and stabilized, um, that's a reduction of 40000 So we took that number time the amount of homeless that we helped, and it was a savings to our community of $57 million. So we're paying for our own position, if not more, and saving the community money. Um, the other thing to look at is a lot of chiefs, when I, you know, train them, they're like, well, I don't know if we have the bodies that are staffing. And I know there's a staffing crisis all across the nation on law enforcement right now, and even, even here in Wichita. But um, keep in mind, we're a 911 unit, so we are at, we are answering calls. So if we didn't have this unit, we've taken 6,000 calls off of patrol since we started. Those calls would have been answered by patrol. So you're just robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, so we do answer calls. We're not taken away from patrol. We are a patrol unit. And we're actually working proactively to reduce those 911 calls because of the work, the type of work that we are doing. And so that's where the savings is, uh, not only by getting homeless people off the streets, but you're also part of patrol uh, working those 911 calls. So it's a wash. So our position is paid for just through the police department as a specialty unit um, uh, working. And that's that's how it works. And, and I, I believe in that model. And I think every agency could do that. Thank you. I'm going to move to Karen because you've got your hand up and then I'll go back to the chat. This kind of goes ties into um, Nate. I run the, the been involved with running the 211 here in Orange County, and we've just recently merged into the United Way. So for those of you who haven't used your 211, you really need to figure out a way to have that partnership. But and we're also the HMIS lead. So we've got a kind of an interesting confluence. And with that, we are we function as the virtual front door with in, into the um, both housing and into the outreach workers for the community. Have you done anything at all with uh, look, looking at moving some of the 911 calls if you have if you can divert have things going into 211 to kind of be the first um, the first step to to be able to help divert and get to other outreach workers like mental health or or any other outreach workers because that might be another way that you can provide some savings as well it, right. i mean it, it takes all of us right so i'm just kind of curious with you on any of that i know you can do that on a larger scale for our city we've done it on a smaller scale so our dispatch gets a call it's almost related i mean some guy just setting up a campsite it's not necessarily an emergency at that moment they'll actually uh, route the call through into our homeless outreach phone for us to answer and then if it's 
someone that's it's not an emergency situation, maybe we're calling Regina and her staff to go out there and we don't even go, have to go to it. Um, so we just, we filled those and, and see if there's a safety issue there, then obviously we would have to respond. But if it's not, if it's just an elderly person in a wheelchair who got who just left the hospital and they're sitting on the sidewalk, yeah, we have uh, social work interns that now work for our city and our department. We we might call them up, tell them what, the, what kind of 911 call came through. Can they get that? And then they're like, yep. And they'll get in their city vehicles and run out to that call where we as police officers don't even have to go to that. So we're doing that as a homeless outreach team already on a probably a smaller scale when it's related to homelessness. Can I add to that? So the Community Mental Health Center actually added two new positions, integrated care specialists. They are housed at 911. And after a series of triage questions, if there is not a crime being committed and no violence, um, yes, they are actually transferred from a call taker or a dispatcher to a mental health professional. Um, not a licensed mental health professional, but one that is specially trained in crisis intervention. And they do that on the phone. They can provide de-escalation, resources, um, that kind of stuff. And then of course they can then dispatch or uh, other mobile crisis units or that collaborative approach with city police. And Regina, and that could be some, I know it's new, we just started it, but the ICT mm -hmm. two through five, that's gonna be similar to that, correct? Um, that Yeah, there's two kind of movements that we're doing. We're doing um, the two embedded in the 911 to hopefully divert field response. And we've had like five to 10 calls that didn't require any field response from that. Um, and then yes, a separate movement would be um, law enforcement recognizing a mental health component and mental health professionals relieving law enforcement from that field response. And I just wanted to make one other comment, which is Nate, the fact that you guys have been doing it for as long as you have, uh, I've heard a question about uh, about trust, right? And and that is so critical. And I don't know if there is a way for you to to come up with something that um, would be a very short, you know, 10 minute clip that talks about what your process has been and the building trust and the results that you've seen. I tell you, that would be so great to get out to your peers in, in different uh, municipalities because so often it takes somebody speaking the same language, right? So you've come up against the, the issue of trust and, and the, the issues of HMIS and the privacy and all of those things it really makes a big difference. And I think at the end of the day, we all have to work together to solve this problem. So you're to be commended, very impressed. Thank you. And part of, like, like I said, I train other cities as part of that training is building trust, not only with the providers, which you just said, but there's also a trust issue you have to deal with your homeless population and building up your clout. And what, is that, what does that process look like and how does that work too? So uh, the trust thing is almost twofold, you know, uh, two different avenues that you have to explore and understand the dynamics of that. Thank you. Um, our next question, Regina, can you speak to how your team interacts with the hot team? For example, do they receive referrals or respond on scene? What services are available on the back end for unhoused folks? Yeah, so we kind of have two routes. Um, I think right now, primarily the hot team works with our outpatient services. Um, we have field case managers that work with our SPMI population who are housed to get housing vouchers. That is often where the hot team connects with them, ongoing, locating them, working through the process of getting a housing voucher and getting housed. Um, so that relationship is already kind of built. Um, that's often through email calls, ongoing COC meetings, treatment team meetings. Um, they try and ask if they've had contact with the hot team to join treatment team meetings with that patient and their outpatient treatment providers. On the crisis side, um, eventually the homeless outreach team and all of our co-responder collaborative approach teams will be housed together. So again, building off that trust of if you see someone day to day, every day you kind of build that trust and we'll continue working together. Um, right now, just like Officer Nate has that phone for our hot team, 
The co-responder teams have cell phone numbers that each officer can call to utilize and ask for um, backup in the field for a mental health call, accessing ongoing services, de-escalating a situation, and then screening, of course, for that higher level of care. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, we're in a rural county in Colorado, population 20,000, point in time for 2023 was 69, with many more in the woods. There are a few resources, medical, housing, et cetera. How do you address homelessness, uh, homelessness community in rural remote areas? Uh, I, I think for me, I've, like I said, I've trained smaller agencies. Um, I trained one eight. I'm not going to mention them because I think it'd be inappropriate, but one agency was just a long, probably about half an hour, 45 minute drive from a major city, and they didn't have a lot of resources and they were a smaller city. Um, and so one of the recommendations I made after giving them some training is a lot of times there's resources out there in the area within that county that you can tap into that maybe you didn't know. And so one of the things when we first started to do was we're just police officers. We didn't know a lot of the resources that were there. And so we had to go around and start asking questions and visiting places and and looking around and talking to United Way, you know, in their two on one. And I it was I was blown away of how many more resources are out there that I didn't know about just by going around and looking. Um, the other thing is sometimes uh, you have to do transportation. Um, there was a lot of times our inpatient treatment beds for substance abuse are full maybe in Wichita, but there's a adjoining town maybe 30 minutes away and we're driving a homeless person 30 minutes into another city to get them into a treatment. Um, so tapping into those resources within the surrounding area and just make and overcoming those transportation gaps is, would be something to be looking at. And I think that's about the best advice I, you know, I can give for the smaller agencies. Thank you. Um, we have a very specific question. Do you have housing set up for sex offenders for youth? Uh, they have this, this writer has youth who are aging out at 19. Um, specifically for sex offenders, uh, specific housing, no, but what we did do is uh, we worked with our housing department and um, our social workers that are embedded with us, and we developed like a six-page list of affordable housing list, and then with that, we talked to the landlords about who they will take and who they won't take. Sometimes they'll take sex offenders, but they don't want someone who has a drug conviction, right? And other ones will say, we're okay with drugs, but we don't want sex offenders. So it, and then we write those disclaimers on every single apartment complex or location of, you know, uh, what they will take, what they want. And then that way, when you give someone who has those type of issues, they can go through and it's easy, the list is quick and easy for them to go through and select those landlords that will accept them. Great. You mentioned that you're responding to calls. Would you say that this is primarily reactive or do you proactively conduct outreach to meet and engage with people experiencing homelessness to get them connected to resources before they become involved in the system? Right. It's uh, So I have, a, like I said, in the PowerPoint, we probably have like 20 uh, things that our team does. Um, uh, one of them is responding to 911 calls, but when we're not on the 911 call, we're doing proactive work, uh, visiting our campsites, doing outreach. We see someone, we stop over, just start talking with them, building that rapport. Uh, we also, we're the only ones that can enforce our camping ordinance. We don't want officers to just be arresting homeless people uh, because they're camping, because there's a there's a there's legalities for that. You have to prove that there's shelter space available. Even if you prove the shelter space available, you have to give them ample time to get into that, whether it's 24 hours or 48 hours, uh, and give them that opportunity and assist them. Right. So that's a that's a whole process. And that gets us into doing outreach and getting them connected with services as well. Um, so, I, you know, I'd say maybe a fourth of our day is, is answering 911 calls. The rest is doing pro more proactive work. Thank you. Um, Kathleen McCloy, you had a question about building trust, and I think that we've kind of come back and forth with that, but if you had any specific questions about that, did you want to come off mute and ask? Yes, I'm just wondering, like, what was your first steps in building the trust? Because um, our homeless population, especially when you get into, like, the HMO, 
IS. Um, even with our coordinated entry, they they often don't answer the questions correctly, especially about addictions, mental health, because they they're afraid of afraid of the system. Um, in our community, we have a special task force that um, of officers that kind of target community outreach, but um, we just had a really wonderful meeting at the men's shelter where those officers actually served the meals, but there were some of the homeless people that like, uh -uh, I'm not going and off they went. <laughs> and it was because of that officer presence. So what was your first steps? I mean, that I, I would think that had to be one of the biggest challenge. <laughs> You, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, you're, I'm doing a flashback of 10 years ago when we first started our team. And I was the downtown officer, and all I did was arrest homeless people all day. And then I got, I walk into a homeless shelter and wanting to uh, get approval to start this homeless outreach team. And they're, all they knew is me writing them tickets and taking them in jail. And here I am wanting to start a homeless outreach team. So, how do you, you know, how do you build that trust? Because they don't trust you at that point, right? Uh, so one of the things I, I realized is um, I said, you know what, sometimes we deal with like people that are in riots. What you do is you take out the leader and then everyone else, you know, kind of follows or stops or whatever. So I kind of took the same philosophy. Uh, I figured out who the leader of the homeless people person was or the homeless population was. And I knew if I could get to them and help them, that it would be like a domino effect. And that's exactly what happened. We had this uh, one guy. Uh, his name was Rooster, and he was kind of like the king of all the homeless. And so we went out, and I built a rapport with him. I let him know, hey, I'm not here to run you for warrants. I'm not taking you to jail. Uh, you know, I want to talk to him about the Housing First program. And um, through meeting with him multiple times, he, we built that trust. But it was a lot of a lot of times building that friendship up and him always having a positive experience with our homeless outreach team. Uh, once we helped him out and got him into housing, he told all of his friends and our homeless outreach phone was literally blowing up overnight. It was, we couldn't even catch up with all the calls. Um, so you, you got to prove yourself and, and you have to show and, and go after those that are well known in the homeless community. And that's how we built our clout up. Uh, now um, it's gotten to the point where we've been around so long, I can go to a campsite and someone's kind of standoffish to me because they see the uniform. And I said, hey, I'm Officer Nate with the homeless outreach team. They said, oh, you're Officer Nate? I've heard everything about you. And so everyone starts to hear about the hot team. And so when you come out and say that, you built that cloud up and that trust already with the name, the brand recognition, right? And and then you're able to all of a sudden, it switches like that, and they, they're open up to you and start talking. The other thing I teach other police departments to do, I know we don't do it here just because of uh, the our management has chosen not to, but a lot of times we'll change the uniform, and it's still a police uniform, but it's a softer uniform, so it looks a little bit more friendly, and it's different from the other police officers, so they know the distinction. Uh, also, what we did in our department is most, you know, officers they have a regular police car. We have a police truck that goes four wheel drive, so we can drive up into the park. When they see our truck, they know it's the hot team. It's not just some officer out there trying to write them tickets and everything else. So they're not running away from you when you pull up in your, in your vehicle, because ours is different. So there's a lot of different tactics uh, that are out there that we've done and have been able to build that trust up, but it, it did take time, not gonna lie. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I do have to say our community officers, they are wearing yellow vests too. So I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, just one more question. How long do you think it actually took for a period of time before you really saw the trust? The trust, um, if I had to estimate, it's probably about three months of us doing outreach, uh, getting our name out there, um, getting going after the leaders in the homeless community and getting their trust and buy-in. But to me, three months, I, you know, that's pretty quick. If you look at my 22-year career on the police department, three months is nothing. It's totally worth it. Excellent. Thank you for those examples. Um, once housing is established, is there a follow-up? How is sustainability addressed? Well, I know, Regina, maybe you might take this because I know um, your case managers and stuff work with them once they get into housing. 
Yeah, I'm probably not as good as I used to be since I'm not in the homeless realm, more crisis, but each housing program has different qualifications and then required follow-up. So like shelter plus care and housing first has case management requirements that yes, they do have to have ongoing case management to continue that voucher versus like section eight um, does not require that. It kind of depends on which provider is providing which care for each voucher. Um, in the mental health world where I come from, we don't want ongoing case management. We want to teach the skills and then graduate them um, with the opportunity to continue and utilize crisis services or come back if they continue to struggle. Um, I think substance use programs have a little bit different philosophy and have longer ongoing sponsorship with those vouchers and programs. Um, but then of course, our community has the Community Crisis Center, which will always have ongoing access to crisis intervention services as needed. I don't know, Nate, if you know more about the specific housing vouchers and what they require. Right. Pretty much every voucher that I know of, maybe except for rapid rehousing, yeah. outside of rapid rehousing, every voucher requires um, some type of case management wraparound services. So when we meet with a homeless person out, uh, we have a forum where we ask them a bunch of questions to kind of see uh, which one they would qualify for, or which one would be the best suited for them. You know, if they have a substance abuse issue, we're not going to send them to Regina. We're going to send them to our substance abuse center of Kansas and get them connected with a peer mentor. That peer mentor will meet them once a week in their home, uh, making sure, you know, they're addressing their substance abuse issue, which is why they're homeless, uh, maybe help them get IDs, those type of things. And so um, you can't just put someone into housing and, and expect that to work. In fact, I was in a conference with Robert Malbutt. He I uh, was appointed uh, by the President of the United States to the United States Agency Council on Homelessness for a while as a director. And he actually had a workshop where he said that housing first can fail, and it was due to the, the lack of the uh, case management piece. If you're just putting them in, the, in an apartment or a house, the reasons why they were homeless are still there, and they will end up recidivating back into the community and the homelessness. So that that important was key. And so, and I know that. And so this a couple of years ago, I applied the Department of Justice for a grant um, when I partnered with the housing department to bring in more case managers for that reason. And it's called Project Hope, Homeless Outreach Proactive Enforcement. And it was to really make sure that we get those people stabilized and stayed into housing once we do get into housing. Thank you. Um, next one says, one of the biggest issues we have seen in Ohio is a housing shortage for affordable units, new developments that are pricing out residents and safe and stable transitional housing units. How have you addressed this if faced with this problem? So, uh, yes, and that's a problem nationwide. Um, and, you know, you can even get a voucher and sometimes you might have a Section 8 voucher, which you only have to pay 30% of your income. Uh, but there's even a cap on that. So sometimes this housing goes above that cap and they can't even meet the 30%. Um, not so much in the Midwest. I think we haven't hit that spot, but you're right, affordable housing and people are making, renovating a new complex and then the price of, the, of those, uh, that apartment goes up. One of the things that city did, which was very innovative, I thought, is uh, through a lot of grants and also some COVID money and ARPA funds, uh, they took some of those funds and they bought out um, structures that maybe it was an old apartment complex or one of the buildings that we bought was a, uh, a hotel and they turned it into affordable housing with um, making it affordable. They had an agency through um, uh, the providers run it and it's only for homeless that have vouchers and then they can control the prices and, and, and make sure it's affordable. So I think, uh, you know, something our city hadn't done until we got a new uh, housing director who's been amazing and, and some of those innovative things that, that, that we can do. Uh, you know, with city housing. A lot of times cities don't want to get involved in the housing piece, but what we did is we bought the property and then let um, a, another provider run it, right? And so that's how you can kind of control um, what's going on right there in, in, a, in a way. So really quick, because I was the one who posted that, when you say you let someone else provide it, because again, I'm located in Columbus, Ohio, and 
we've had situations like this, but unfortunately what's happened is those providers are out of state providers or, you know, people who manage the apartment complex. And let's just say it did not go well. So I didn't know, like, do you, your providers who run it and manage it, are they local and do they have to be in state? Uh, well, luckily, we, yeah, we had, it's local and they've already, we're in the business of affordable housing and some other units. So we knew that they had the experience to do that. So it, was, it ended up being a perfect fit for us. Excellent. Um, so the next question is, if people aren't housed within 24 hours and you see them on the street again, are they arrested? What happens then? Are you talking about in regards to our camping ordinance? I, I, I'm not I'm sure. Um, Alicia, did you want to come off mute and explain? Sorry, I was answering a question um, in the chat. What was that again? So if people aren't housed within 24 hours, you would ask if people aren't housed within 24 hours and you see them on the street again, are they arrested? Yeah, he, uh, Officer Nate had mentioned that um, earlier about if they aren't housed in within 24 or 48 hours, um, they, I, I was clarifying about that after 24 or 48 hours, if, if they're found on the street again, then what, the what happens after that? Uh, the way our process works, and like I said, we follow a lot of case law on this, is, uh, you know, we offer shelter space or housing um, to someone who's maybe camping, like on city property, only not private property, city, and we give them a referral, we have to prove their shelter space, and in 24 hours, if they're still there, they still get an option to use the shelter space or stop the illegal behavior, or technically they could be cited. And I can tell you that no homeless person wants to go to jail, so they choose one of the other two options. Um, since our camping ordinance went into effect uh, in 2013, we've arrested zero homeless people on, our, on mm -hmm. our camping ordinance. So you as a city can still have a camping ordinance and not necessarily try to arrest your way out of homelessness. And we, I think we proved it here in Wichita with our program. Okay. And then, and then, so I, I've worked in, you know, shelters before, and a lot of times there are no beds. How does that process work? Um, do you pay for hotels or? We don't pay for hotels on that. Um, yeah, some other agencies do do that. Um, that that's a possibility uh, as an option. Um, but let's say that we can't get a hotel voucher or whatever, and there's no shelter space available. They're legally camping by federal law. Okay, Martin versus Boise. You guys can look it up. It's Supreme Court ruling. Really. Um, so yeah, there's times uh, we have uh, issues where our female shelter beds are full, um, and then we all said night the tent has a female in there. Um, she's legally camping. Yeah, you, know, you don't. Why arrest somebody and then they have nowhere else to go? That you've just criminalized homelessness, right? So uh, that's why we have a specialty unit because we got to make sure that that doesn't happen. Okay. Excellent. Um, um, that's for Officer if Nate. Could, oh. If I could jump in just for a second, Officer Nate, I I think I maybe I missed it. So if I'm asking you to repeat yourself, I'm sorry, but. You had mentioned this facility uh, that the city had purchased to provide services and housing. Where did the funding come from for that? Because I imagine that that's a pretty big expenditure and especially like getting services provided there, it must have been a big undertaking with more than just the police department involved. Could you walk me through that a little bit? Because I've heard of, of cities doing that, purchasing a hotel or something like that embedding services there but I, i'm a little fuzzy on how you get from point a to point b no i mean that's a good question and also don't want it to come off as, as it was an easy fix i mean it was a little bit of lucky because of uh covid money our funds that come in that we need we had to spend and it had to be towards addressing homelessness and so that's how we were able to do that we all know that those type of funds are are you know not going to be in existence now so you have to look at other resources maybe it's writing a grant uh, you know, getting grants for a project to do something like that. Um, the other thing we've done is, is uh, years ago, the city was involved in uh, owning a bunch of uh, housing properties all over. Um, but we, you know, get, kind of wanted to get out of the uh, landlord business. So we sold off a lot of those properties, which opened up money to build um, a homeless campus instead with those same funds for housing. Um, so those type of things. Uh, we have other tax incentive uh, 
you know, routes you can take that the federal government will give you tax breaks on that you can utilize those type of funds. And I'm not the expert on this, by the way. I'm just trying to repeat what I've heard. So uh, forgive me if I uh, say anything that is incorrect. Um, we have a tax on liquor and, and cigarette taxes, and those can only be used for certain types of like recovery treatment centers. So we can use those funds to get beds and recovery center. Um, so there's a lot of different things that, you, that I've seen and learned about from doing this that you can utilize certain dollars uh, for that. Thank you. That's that's really helpful because I, I thought I had heard you mention grants, but yeah, it was the, the COVID and the ARPA funds were the initial kickoff. Um, so thank you for that. I appreciate it. So what, uh, this one I think is for Officer Nate, what do you do with individuals that you come into contact with during the evenings or nights when the resources are not available? Great question. Um, when I first got trained in police homeless outreach teams, I had a vision of us being 24 seven and, and working nights and days. And, and the trainer said, no, don't do that because there's no, there's not a lot of services in the evenings. And a lot of your homeless are either in the shelter at night or if they're camping outside, they're asleep and you're just annoying them and you're not able to help them. I didn't listen to that advice and I probably should have. Uh, so I, uh, we put an officer at, at night and he, uh, he would just hand them a card and say, call the hot team during the day, even though he was part of the hot team because he's, he couldn't help them. Um, so it's a tough situation. You're a lot of your resources for us. They're limited, uh, in regards to, um, you know, a lot of the service providers, I know crisis and Regina works crisis. That is 24 seven at night. Uh, but again, that's just from someone who's in a crisis situation. What I did do is that we went around and we met with all the homeless shelters and we said, Hey, I understand you close your doors at six o'clock or seven o'clock and you don't take anybody after hours. Is there any way that you can take someone if it's a police officer who's transporting and they walk the person in, make sure everything's safe, make sure they're compliant. They lay down the bed and, and don't cause any problems. Will you take someone after hours that the police officer is escorting them? And I was able to get buy-in from everyone on that. And so that's how we're able to open the doors on the off hours. When our team doesn't work, we work during the days with the providers, but uh, the average officer is now educated on what the process is and what they can do after hours, at least for the shelter space. Yeah, I would just add that all of our crisis services, we um, function under a self-identified crisis. So if that individual is identifying that their current homeless status is a crisis at that moment, we will respond and provide resources and support at 2 a.m. Um, we've worked really hard on the community and our staff to utilize self-identified crisis versus what we might classify as a mental health crisis. But we do run into the same barriers Officer Nate does. Of they do let us coordinate shelter admissions as well um, through the Community Crisis Center. But yeah, all the other housing resources are Monday through Friday, eight to five. Rachel, you've got your hand up. You're you're still muted. Does it, did that work? Yep, thanks. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Rachel Bittaker, and I have Cameron Shoemaker here with the St. Joseph Police Department, and we're really trying to implement something um, in our community that's kind of around this model, but we are very unique here. We have no emergency shelters. We have very low housing stock. Um, we have a, a family guidance center that operates that does have a crisis. It's just very difficult to get into. Um, so I just wanted to kind of maybe ask you a question about the possibility of a Sarasota has a kind of model that uses a hot team as well um, to develop hotbeds that have case managers there in the evenings. Do you think that that would be almost like a shelter because we don't have any shelters? The closest one to us is probably an hour away in Kansas, downtown Kansas City. Um, just how we can, we are seeing an increase of homelessness in our, in our population, in our community. Um, and just really want to try to get ahead of ahead of it as much as we can, even though we're behind the the eight ball. Um, so coming up with those hotbeds, do you think that that would be something valuable to have um, without having that individual shelter here in our community? Yeah, when you say hotbeds, are you referring to like a like a FEMA tent with cots inside of it, or what do you mean by that? 
So currently we have, um, I run a cold weather shelter here that we open up during the winter time just to prevent death on the street due to, to, to the cold. Um, so that actually has the capability of possibly being turned into a quote unquote shelter um, for these hotbeds. Um, and then we would staff in the overnight and then of course during, I guess overnight in the weekends because then resources are available during the day. Um, so we would kind of handle it in that situation. And it holds, pro we can hold probably around uh, 40 individuals with their broke up sides for men and women, so. I mean, yeah, I think that there would have been a brain. What's that? Sorry, I didn't, I missed that. I just, that's okay. I just wanted to think in your brain about it. Just like what you thought about it. If, you know, I just, I feel like Cameron and I are talking like that's what's missing. We, you know, in our community without having that, that shelter that we can say, hey, it's two o'clock in the morning. There's no resources available. We really don't want to leave you on the street, but we have no other option. Um, if we could somehow incorporate that into our hot model, um, that's kind of how we're, moving in that direction, but just wanted to see your thoughts on that. No, I mean, that definitely, uh, you know, the, the resources that can benefit law enforcement to have an option for them to go. Uh, the other thing to think about, too, is when someone's trying to work or get a job and they're sleeping outside, they're not getting good sleep, uh, their brain is not clicking as good. And no, we all would be that way, right? Um, you get someone and they, they get into housing or they get into shelter, they're able to sleep. Uh, stay warm, um, you notice a change in them, and they're able to focus a little bit more, focus on recovery and whatever, whatever it's mental illness or, or substance abuse issues. Uh, we see individuals that are, when they're camping outside, they're utilizing substance abuse more than when they're in shelter space for whatever reason. Same thing with housing. Um, so those are a lot of factors that you take into consideration of some of the uh, positives that can come out of making sure that that, that emergency shelter is there. But you also want to focus on the housing piece because if you're getting them into your the idea is to get people into shelter, but then the, from day one you got to be working on the exit plan, not just storing them away, right? So. Yeah, I pre I appreciate that. Thank you. I think um, I just wanted to kind of break in and say that I think a link has been added to the chat for those who might have to hop off at the top of the hour of a stepping up webinar that Officer Nate spoke on. So if you want to grab that link before you go, I know that we are coming to the top of the hour. So I, I expect some folks may have to go. Um, but back to the questions, do you have any data collection tools for recording information on both clients and encampments that they live in? Um, yeah, so what we do is uh, we have, uh, we just use an Excel spreadsheet that's live between all of our homeless outreach officers and so like, if a community uh, person comes in and uh, has a complaint, we log it and then we put the disposition and, and what we do with it. We also log our stats. So we have what's called an ODOR, Officer Daily uh, Report of everything that we do throughout the day. And we log the stats. How many homeless did we get into housing today? How many referrals did we get? How many did we get into shelter? Um, you know, campsite cleanups, you know, how many did we post or you know, all those stats uh, that we record and it's for data quality purposes, which also is good, uh, number one, for sustainability within the police department, because you're going to have supervisors that want to ask questions and say, hey, what do you guys do, right? Uh, but also for uh, writing grants, you know, I think our grants that we got through the Department of Justice was successful because we were able to show um, our team and our success through data-driven measurements. And I know sometimes community policing is hard to quantify, um, but that if you can somehow figure out some data to collect through your success stories and all that, that's going to help you write grants and get funding in for some of these gaps that you have within your community. Um, do you have resources for helping folks get IDs? Um, we do. We're actually getting ready to the city to generate move to a bit even better initiative. Actually, I visited a Haven for Hope in San Antonio, and they had a really good process that we're trying to implement here. Uh, for us, what we did is uh, I worked with state legislators because it's really tough in Kansas to get IDs for homeless population. We have some pretty strict laws on that, and I'm sure a lot of other states do. Uh, what we did is we worked with state legislators to approve if someone was on parole 
or they went to the jail that they could print off what's called a wrap sheet uh, or a face sheet, whatever you want to call it. And it gets certified and stamped by the jail, but it's a picture of them with all their information. It's obviously them because they came in and did their fingerprint, right? So it's pretty much, it's, it's, it's them. And then they can use that as a form of ID to get their real ID through Kansas, Kansas ID. Uh, another innovative thing that in Haven for Hope at San Antonio was doing, which we're, I'm trying to get to go happen with us, is law enforcement has an, a program, and they might be called different in other places. It's called ours. It's called Morph ID, where they take a box and they just put their fingerprint on it, and it scans all through the nation, and then it pops up their name based on their fingerprint, and then they can print off uh, that information, and that's used as a form of ID, and you know exactly who it is. So it's similar to what the jail is already doing too as well. So those are some probably innovative ways to help homeless people get ideas, ideas because that was a huge barrier in Kansas for us. So. Thank you. Um, someone did want to say thank you for saying that about housing first. Uh, if the fidelity of the program is followed, you can have a high success rate of people uh, retaining housing. Um, and then our looks like our next question or next comment is, I'm seeing the same scenario in Baltimore County with new developments of units and the apartment complex will state the applicants with a voucher will have to qualify the same as others who do not hold a voucher. So for example, having to make three or four times the rent, it discourages clients um, and limits their affordable housing opportunities. This circles back to increasing numbers of families becoming homeless without access to affordable housing. Correct. And that's, that's, you know, that's a barrier everywhere. And I always say the term people talk about, we need more affordable housing. Uh, we're in the Midwest and, and we, I believe we have affordable housing right now, even though I know the price of things are going up. Um, what I like to call is lack of affordable housing. What I mean by, or uh, access, access to affordable housing. And what I mean by access is the thing that you're just talking about. And there, there's a bunch of them. Not only is the, the 30, the three times the rent rate is an issue, uh, people have felonies is an issue. People have evictions are an issue. And so uh, so people that don't want to take a Section 8 voucher, for whatever reason, the landlord doesn't. So there's there's lots of other barriers um, that have access to affordable housing. Um, again, that kind of goes back to working with those providers that can either, um, like we have an agency here that has their own housing complex to break down those barriers. I think ComCare does too, and a mental health association for people in mental health, they, that agency buys a complex and they don't have those barriers because they're the landlord. Um, like when our city, we purchased that hotel to have this other provider run it, we made it so that this had to be for homeless people and it couldn't, you couldn't put up those barriers, those walls, right? That was part of the agreement. And so those are some of the innovative ways you can kind of try to get around um, some of those access to affordable housing issues that all of us are experiencing. Thank you. Um, someone asked, do you avoid writing names as you encounter people to reduce the likelihood of becoming aware of any warrants? How do you handle it if you become aware of someone's warrant while trying to provide services? Um, that's a tricky situation because uh, by state, or actually probably federal law, um, if we know that someone has a warrant, we're ordered by the courts to take them into custody. However, I worked with uh, our last chief of police. Uh, we talked about this issue once with a homeless female that was in a tent. And uh, it was something minor, like a parking ticket or something. It was, you know. And so what we did is we uh, worked with our warrant section to, and we filled out what's called blue sheets. So as long as you um, uh, provide due process, which is what the process, we have to give them due process of speed, right to a speedy trial based on their warrant, we can call up and get them a new court date for uh, their warrant uh, through this uh, blue sheet. So they're not, they're not even having to go to jail. They just get a new court date. Um, the other thing we just started doing is one of our other community policing units is called um, it's, it, it's a day like every Thursday where you can walk in and get a new court date for your warrants and you don't even have to go to jail. And we also worked with our court system where you can do walk-ins in the morning every single day to get a new court date instead of having to go to jail. And so we'll encourage our homeless population. Sometimes we're just talking to them on the phone and I obviously can't arrest them. And they tell me they have a warrant. And I said, well, hey, go up and do the, the, the walk-in at the court docket, get a new court date and give me a call and we'll, we'll start working on some things. So there's uh, ways that you can get around that. We do not run our homeless population for warrants. If they're just hanging out and we're doing outreach, 
they're not a criminal at that moment. They're not um, a suspect in any crimes. There's no reason for us to be running them for warrants and, and doing that, you know? Um, so we, we don't run someone for warrants unless they're in the act of committing a crime or a disturbance, or there's a reason why. That's awesome. Um, speaking of advice that you didn't take in the beginning, if you could go back in time and give yourself three pieces of advice related to launching this program and making it successful, what would those be? Um, building trust with the providers, uh, working eight to five Monday through Friday, not week working weekends, and then uh, not working nights, uh, working with the providers, you know, um, I think that would probably be the big things uh, that I would we did a lot of good things early on. I think I got a lot, of, I got very lucky on some of the things I did. Um, but um, those would be some of the advice I'd give my old, my old self when I had hair. Excellent. Thank you. Um, let's see. A lot of questions about the recording. So yes, this is being recorded and there it will be posted to the website uh, probably early next week, but perhaps the holiday may change that. So definitely by the week after we expect to have it posted. Um, do you have any drop-in centers that you utilize? Not a shelter, but a building or space where you can get homeless people off the streets, mostly chairs for them to use and be indoors? We do. Um, oh, I want to say six or seven years ago, maybe longer, uh, we started or the agency uh, started a provider uh, called a day shelter or we call it open door. And it's a day shelter for the day, but also has a little wraparound resources from actually ComCare, uh, Regina's uh, up on the second floor of that building. Um, we have veterans that come in. We have uh, nurses that come in that, that work with homeless, even if they're uninsured or don't have any funds. Um, they can do laundry there. They can take showers. They can get, they get meals there. Um, so it, it does give law enforcement somewhere to go to take someone or maybe they're in, they came to your town and they're stranded and they don't know the resources. Great. It's perfect for law enforcement to be able to take someone there and, and, and get them started and, and, some, and there were some resources and then transition them into housing or another shelter in the evening. Thank you. Um, has any, has anyone had or have a structured encampment that has controlled measures? Um, has that worked for you? We have no shelters or spread out campsites. And spread out campsites, sorry. Oh, sorry. What was the question again? The controlled? Yes. Yeah, so I, I don't know, Amy, if you wanted to come off mute and talk a little bit more, kind of explain your uh, question a little bit more. Like a tent city or a, a legalized so. camping area? Yeah. So it's called, she's saying like a structured encampment. Control. Um, structure governance either by the city or a nonprofit um where it's just not just some random campsite but there's uh porta potties and um right. garbage okay. dumpsters showers yeah. i know what you're talking about um i did visit one in florida called pinellas hope which is a really good model if you want to look that up um and it was structured uh it had everything you said security individual plots for tents um you know, our COC and, and city looked at, didn't talk about doing something like that. We actually voted against it. There's pros and cons to it. There's safety issues when you take a bunch of people have mental health issues and substance abuse and you put them all together. Um, you often get a lot of 911 calls. Um, the other issue is sometimes allowing that it kind of fosters that into making them be better at being homeless. And mm -hmm. they oftentimes it's harder to get them out of their situation um, because they're still, they're start to get used and feel safe living that lifestyle. So, uh, so I think that, that that's just something for your city to, to analyze and look at if that's something that you guys want to do. Okay. When you were talking earlier about warrants, did you call it a lock-in or a walk-in where they could come and get a new court date? Correct. It's called a walk-in docket for us. Walk with a walk W? Walk-in docket, yes. Thank you. I think, Carly, did you want to talk about, it looks like Denver might have a similar um, approach. Did you want to talk about that? Yeah, thanks, Deirdre. Um, Denver opened several safe outdoor spaces um, over the past three-ish years, um, with a few more to be slated to open this year and next year. Um, so these are, you know, city-sanctioned campsites 
uh, that have, you know, facilities, a communal kitchen, restrooms. Um, they actually use, if you click on the link, they use like um, ice fishing tents actually for folks. Um, and the idea is that these are um, short-term facilities uh, that allow people stability to be able to work on permanent housing. So the idea isn't that they remain in a safe outdoor space, uh, you know, indefinitely, but that they're provided with at least a place to be and the, you know, resources and supports that they need uh, in order to be able to work on housing. And they've been um, pretty successful and there's always community pushback to these, right? Wherever they open, the community you know, there's differing opinions. Um, but I will say that the Denver Police Department loves these sites. They say they never have to go on calls there. They're not a disruption uh, to the community. So I think that, you know, speaks volumes about how well run these sites are. Um, and, you know, we're dealing with folks being priced out of our housing market and, you know, lack of available affordable units. So these have been a good temporary solution for a lot of folks who are unhoused in our community. Thanks, Carly. And like she said, there's a there's a link in the chat now. Um, uh, would it be possible to send the form that is completed um, daily officer report? Our agency is starting a hot and this would be something good to incorporate in our data collection efforts. Um, that would have to be good permission from uh, above my pay grade, uh, but I'll just put down my email and I can forward those requests on and see. Get permission to do that. There's my email. Thank you. <clears throat> um, do you have contact information for community? Or I actually uh, contact information community housing work group in West Virginia. So I can share um, to save to give this presentation to our group. I am the only representative here. Um, so Amy, I can let you know that this will be recorded. But uh, and then in the chat, Officer Nate's just provided his information, and also I can share our learning site. Um, landing page, which has more information there as well. I seem to have hit the end of our questions. So I'm going to pause and see if anyone wants to come off mute or come on camera and ask some questions to our speakers today directly. Um, I have a bit of a follow-up question about some of the kind of creative ways. I know that some jurisdictions, and I, this might be more for Regina, um, but I know some jurisdictions have used one approach of like using social workers or case managers to practice interviews for folks that are looking to get into housing if they know that there's going to be an interview process. Have you looked into any of those types of um, approaches to kind of help people get prepared to get into housing? Um, so I'll let Nate talk about his social workers. They're a little bit different than mine. Um, but yes, so those individuals who meet like the SPMI, the severe mm -hmm. persistent mental illness, and they have a assigned case manager, that is something that we are told to help them do. Like they need to practice going to look at an apartment. What questions do you ask? How do you talk to your landlord about um, problems with neighbors, problems with your landlord, paying bills, all that. So yes, on the mental health side, that is something that case managers should be doing for those individuals. And then right. Another another piece of that is our uh, our housing department, our, our social workers that work with the housing department. Uh, they work with our individuals. They also build a relationship with uh, the landlords that they have worked with in the past. And those landlords know that all these vouchers, they, they're going to have someone there visiting the units once a week. And that's, uh, that's good to have buy-in from those landlords and, and also building those relationships and that trust. Thank you. Any last minute questions from folks? Uh, my name's John. I have a question. Uh, if you know, how would the numbers of like this year's uh, point in time count break down in terms of people that are experiencing homelessness and are unsheltered versus in 
emergency shelter or some type of uh, temporary housing? And how does the capacity of your shelter system compare to those numbers? Um, I can, well, as far as the unsheltered, uh, you know, nationwide, we're seeing a lot of people that are becoming unsheltered uh, through the, the numbers that, that's being reported to HUD. And here in Wichita, two years ago, we were at 9.9% of our homeless population was unsheltered. And now this last one, we're at uh, 21%. So we actually had a double of uh, unsheltered. And so, um, you know, we're looking to increase our capacity here uh, through, I, I already talked about that initiative a little bit earlier. Um, and so, because you want to make sure that, that you're filling that gap. So, and we're seeing that, that those issues nationwide. Thank you. Thanks so much. I see a hand. Did you want to come off mute and, and ask your question? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, let me make sure I go ahead and lower that real quick. All right, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, my name is Maynard Gentry. Um, I'm a certified peer support specialist. And I was just wondering, um, you know, your programs, do they have anything while incarcerated? Like, you know, for the people, let's say they're going to be coming into this situation once they're released, maybe how to deal with it, um, kind of some peer support stuff. And then, you know, from there, once they leave incarceration, they can go into a support system or anything like that. Or do they have to kind of register, um, you know, once they're out and then it's like, OK, I'm homeless in this situation now. And um, I was just wondering how that went. No, you're right. Uh, in the past, uh, that's what was happening. They were just getting released and to the shelter, and now they're homeless, and here they are. And I think there should have been something beforehand. Um, our city housing has already reached out to our Kansas Department of Corrections to uh, start that process of reintegration. The other thing is our, our jail system uh, started a offender reentry program. So even in the jail, they're working with the homeless population. They're helping them get IDs. Uh, they're getting that process started for housing. Because uh, we do see that as an issue, and and that's something that you know your city needs to be looking at and meeting with uh, either the jail and also uh, your uh, prison population and systems. Great, that's excellent. Then to know that they have, you know, that help ahead of time, so it's not so impactful for them once they are, you know, released. So that's absolutely. good. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, thank you much for that uh, information. Thank you. Any other questions? I see someone shared a link to an example out of Southern Nevada um, that goes back to data collection. It looks like a nice resource for folks um, if they wanted to check that out. But I'm going to pause here and see if anyone wants to ask any questions. Uh, my name is Olinda. Um, I did send a direct message to you, Officer Nate. Um, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I'm paying, trying to pay attention, but I'll try to respond to those as soon as I can. I know, thanks. All right, last call on questions then. Okay, uh, this is Amy McDonald again. I'm sorry. So we've had some situations in our city, which is probably about 45,000 population. We're not real big. Um, we don't have any shelters. The city has called for a meeting with all the nonprofits next week to see what we can do. And so uh, there's a lot of ideas, and that's why I asked about the encampment. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with it because we, you know, our focus is permanent housing. Um, but does anyone have like any ideas, Nate? Do you have an officer, Nate? Do you have any ideas of, you know, where do we start? Where do we get started? You know, I've brought up hot teams to the city before, and it's just kind of seems like it doesn't go anywhere. Um, you know, 60% of our homeless population has mental health issues, and about 20% has substance abuse issues. Um, but, you know, this, this, 
I, you know, I just don't know. Uh, I'm trying to say politically correct here, but, you know, we have a great mayor, and but there's, you know, when businesses start to complain, then things get brought to the table. Um, and has anybody had any communities where you need more buy-in from your local government and can't get it or... I don't know. I just I just feel like this next week's gonna be pretty pretty rough. So yeah, it can be tough to get buy-in. Uh, normally, you need a leader, someone that's that's gonna take the charge. You know, for, and which thought it just happened to be me, but um, and then trying to build that buy-in and that trust, and you got a lot of barriers. I mean, you got to go through management, then you got to go through the chief of police, you got to go through uh, the city manager, then city council. They're gonna want you know look at that. Right. And, it was from the beginning of when we first started from when I had the concept to when we went live was two years. So it took two years. Okay. Our home two years. Yeah. Okay. And that was just trying over and trying. And, and you know, there's going to be barriers and doors, you know, shut on right. you. You just got to go around them and, 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 uh, and try to work through those. And that's, that's normal. We, we I see that a lot uh, in other jurisdictions too. Yeah, yeah. Because when you bring it up, everyone's like, "Yeah, that's a great idea. We need to do that." But then it doesn't go anywhere, and then now here we are back again in the same situation. And uh, so, I think one thing that Nate talked about a lot is providers, and going mm -hmm. back to say that homelessness is a community issue, not mm -hmm. a mental health issue or a police issue or a substance use issue um, and getting everyone together for a common goal. Um, like, and I'm starting those conversations that way, I guess. Right. Yeah, we've done a lot and we've done a lot of good work. It's, you know, when you have no shelter beds and you have one night by, well, we have one night by night shelter and that's seasonal and only serves up to uh, 15 people and has high barriers, you know, um, it's, it's difficult. And then you have a lack of housing, affordable housing units. So it's like all these things, you know, and uh, that just, I don't know, it's just this big full circle of barriers and obstacles. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to raise my hand. I don't know how to raise my hand. I hope I can be heard. I don't know where the button is to raise my hand. But this is, this is different than I expected. Uh, I'm working to build affordable rental housing for young people aging out of foster care. And so I want to start by commending all of you who are working with the homeless population. Our goal is to keep these young people from becoming homeless. We've made a commitment that our rent will be affordable. We will not raise the rent as long as they're here so that they can begin to save and have a launch pad and move themselves uh, forward. So I commend all of you for the work that you're doing. And if you have suggestions for Homeworks USA, and we do, we're on the web, it, I'd be happy to hear them about how we can get the word out uh, to social workers who are working with young people in foster care so that they don't end up where you have to intervene, where you have to support that. So, uh, Miss Barbara, where are you at? Uh, we are building in Leavenworth County, but our address is Lawrence, Kansas. Um, we're, we have, we're building tiny homes, uh, single occupancy, um, there's on our website, you can move around and look at how the units will look. We're about 99% completed with the construction. We hope to have young people in by the beginning of 24. We're a very, we're talking about 10 units. So we're not solving the problem, but what we're trying to do is to put a dent in the problem so we can demonstrate that there are ways that you can prevent these young people who were leaving foster care from becoming homeless. 
So I encourage you to go to that website, Homeworks USA. And if you have ideas about how we could be more helpful, but ours is permanent housing in the sense that it is affordable rental housing. And if you look behind you, I'm in one of the tiny houses now. <laughs> uh, so you can have some idea of, of how they look. I didn't intend to show my face here because I don't, I'm not an expert on homelessness, but I have had lots of experience with young people in foster care. And I know our failure has been for those young people who are leaving foster care without the supports that they need. So I don't know how, how to stop this either, but I think I push the mute button so somebody else can talk. Thank you. Don't worry about it, Barbara. If you can't do it, I can do it for you. Um, but I think Stacy might have a question for you. If I'm not sure, but Stacy, it looks like you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, so in Ohio, we have um, what's called FYI vouchers in their... Um, foster to independence foster youth to independence yeah. program mm -hmm. um that we utilize let me see if i can lower my hand um to help individuals that have aged out of the foster care it'll give them um a voucher for three years to help them stabilize and in that period of time they they have access to um case management and life skills to learn how to, you know, budget and um, have adulting life skills, I guess you should say. And then they have the option to enter into like our family sufficiency program, where if their income, like their earned income increases, and their rent would have to go up, that portion of rent that would go up would go into escrow. And then at the you know end of their voucher program, they would receive that money to hopefully either use it to go to school, buy a car, purchase a home or something like that. And if they enter that program, it actually extends that voucher for two more years. Um, and then we do case conferencing around all of those individuals, those vouchers go through um, like the Metropolitan Housing Authorities. And I actually just got an email yesterday or the day before about some um, in more information like that on that. So I don't know if you want to maybe try to utilize some vouchers if they're in your area to help stabilize some of your guys as they move into your tiny home. Thank you very much for that information. And we will, believe me, we will be exploring every possibility. We do have a pre-application for young people who are leaving foster care so that they can see where, where we're building, what we're building, and if it's something they would choose to uh, choose as a housing choice. So we'll That's soon be, be accepting residents and... Um, it won't solve the problem because the problem is larger than any one group can address or any one person or one organization can address. But I commend all of you for working together to, to, to try to solve this problem, which is solvable. Thank you. And it looks like someone had posted um, a one pager on the FYI um, program in the chat. So um, you can check that out as well. But I, any any last minute questions from folks? All right. Well, I wanted to give a very big thank you to both Officer Nate and Regina for joining us today and for facilitating such a great discussion. I want to thank all of you for attending and for participating today. Um, as a reminder, the session was recorded, so it will be posted in the next week or two on the website. Um, thank you all so much. Wishing everyone a healthy and happy Thanksgiving. I'm going to turn my camera off, but stay in the in the meeting for a little bit so that if anyone wanted to catch email addresses or links, the chat will stay up for just a few moments before I close it out. 
But thank you again and have a great afternoon. Bye, guys.